Yesterday, we already kind of went over this page right here. A um, couple things, though, just to remind you, there's some formulas we're going to be talking about. A cost function, uh, this little p of x, which is a demand or price function. I'll give you a little bit more on that today. The revenue, how to find that, we'll be using that. That's your revenue. And hopefully you already have those written down from yesterday. Bless you. And then, of course, big P. There's a capital P there for profit. Because essentially, any company, what they want to do is they want to make the largest profit they can. Unless they are a nonprofit organization, right? If they're a nonprofit organization, those are things like the American Heart Association, any kind of leukemia society, you know, those types of things. A school is a nonprofit. Schools are not allowed to make money. At the end of the year, if they have money left, that's less money that they get from the state the next year. So, you know, you kind of come up with a budget. From there, you take, you spend the money. That's the money that you're given, you know, that sort of thing. You make sure you spend it, okay? All right, um, so here we go. First problem with this. A store has been selling 200 flat screen TVs a week. Oh, this is in your packet, by the way. It's on the front, the very front, the very first one. Um, a store has been selling 200 flat screen TVs a week for $350 each. So, like, you could figure out the revenue right now by just taking how many they sold and how much they sold them for. Okay. A market survey indicates that for each $10 rebate offered to buyers, the number of TVs sold will increase by 20 a week. So in other words, if they sell a TV for $350, but then send the person $10 back that in, in one week, then that means they're going to sell 220 TVs that week. Because it like dangles a carrot in front of the consumer to say, hey, we'll send you money back. We'll give you a rebate. Some of them are instant rebates where they have it right at the register, and some are rebates where you get the rebate check in the mail. Okay? People like the instant rebates better than the one where you get the check in the mail because usually it takes six weeks to get the check. You know, so, you know, they look at those. There's way more instant rebates now than what there were when I was your age. When I was your age, there was no such thing as an instant rebate. Everybody got the check in the mail, okay? Uh, but with using less paper and doing more things, you know, online and like that, it has kind of come to a lot of instant rebates, okay? You see these things happen, Black Friday, it's a great time to make them happen. I mean, it's a marketing <laughs> ploy, all right? Um, the number of TVs sold will increase by 20 a week. Find the demand function, bless you. Notice this demand function. Remember that was called the price function or demand function that we had talked about? And the revenue function, and then the question, how large a rebate should the store offer to maximize its revenue? Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the price or demand function. I kind of put it in the form of a formula for you. That was the little p of x, okay? Not the big p of x, the price for demand function. What you could do, if I was going to put it in the form of a formula, is you could take the current selling price, and you could subtract off um, the rebate, that you're going to offer, divided by like the new increase. I'm trying to kind of put this in. And then parenthesis, and then the number of TVs sold, so that's my X right there, minus how many you already sell. Um, number of TVs or product you already sell. Because what this is going to do is it's going to say, all right, well, now all of a sudden if I'm going to sell 220 TVs, I have to subtract off 
you know, the new number, 220 minus the 200 I already sold, which gives me now the new 20 TVs a week sort of thing, okay? So for this particular problem, the price function would look like this. The current selling price is $350 minus the rebate, which is $10 over the new the increase in how many you're going to have 20 TVs times x minus the number of TVs I already sell 200 now of course this can be simplified and you should simplify it 10 20th is one half I don't want an equal sign right there and then you can even take it further by distributing that minus one half x plus 100 which is 450 minus one half x this here is your price function that was the first question that was asked is can you give a demand or price function the second thing it asked for is um, the revenue function all right, well, let me remind you that revenue is your R of X. Your revenue is the number you sell times the price function. And you have that in your notes already from yesterday if you copied it from that slide. So to find the revenue function, you can see I first have to have the price function. That's why that was asked first. And I take x times 450 minus 1 half x. So my revenue function is 450x minus 1 half x squared. Okay, so those are the first two questions. Then, the final question. How large a rebate should the store offer to maximize its revenue? So yesterday we talked about, we're talking about optimization problems. We're either maximizing or minimizing something. All right, this time we're maximizing. So that's taking the derivative of whatever we're trying to maximize and setting it equal to zero. They want us to maxi maximize the revenue. That's telling me I need to find R prime and set it equal to zero. Just like yesterday, we were trying to maximize the volume or a surface area or whatever it happened to be. We're still doing the same kinds of problems. This one is a little bit different than the others. Um, there's not really a picture, a diagram that you can come up with this one. But you definitely can read and understand the problem. You can kind of put letters to things, which the book pretty much defines the letters that you're going to use. These are the same letters in every book I have ever seen. And that could be an economics book. It could be a math book. Okay, you could see it in either place because it's very much an economics kind of problem. It's a business problem. So that means now I want to take the derivative and set it equal to zero. The derivative of the revenue, that is. So derivative of 450x is 450. Derivative of minus 1 half x squared, the 2 multiplies by the 1 half. I get minus x and I set it equal to zero. Solve to get x by itself, which isn't too hard on that one. This is saying, if I sell 450 TVs, because x represents the number of TVs I've sold. If I sell 450 TVs, I'm going to maximize my revenue. Okay, now, what would the price of the TV have to be? So we go back over here to the price function, and we plug it in. We get 450 minus 1 half times that x, 450, which is 450 minus 225, which equals $225. I would have to sell it for a price of $225 in order to maximize my revenue. But I'm currently selling it for $350. So to find the rebate, I have to take my current price, which is $350, and subtract off how much I need to actually make on the TV. And from there, yeah, 
it gives me my rebate. I could say, hey, I'm going to sell you that TV for $350, but then I'm going to give you $125 back. Well, wouldn't you consider buying it? I mean, think about it. A $350 TV. If the company said, hey, we're marking them down $125, and you needed a TV, wouldn't you consider buying it? Okay. So the whole idea here is there is a break point where if you sell it for less enough, you know, like a, a lower amount, you're going to sell more and end up making more money. Okay, that's the whole idea. And how are any of you taking um, economics at all? Anybody in here taking economics? Anybody going to? Oh, you can't next year because you're all seniors. You're taking economics. You talk about that kind of stuff in there. It's very much an economic thing. Most of you, when you go to get your degree, whatever degree it is, doesn't matter what degree it is, many of you will take a microeconomics and a macroeconomics class in college. And these are the types of things you talk about. Okay? And understand. You know, like I can tell you with the business that I have, by not accepting credit card, you don't have as high of sales. But if all of a sudden you say, hey, I'll take a credit card, which costs me three and a quarter percent. So every hundred dollars I sell, three dollars and twenty-five cents I won't make on that. But people will spend hundreds of dollars more because they can use their credit card. Because they don't have the cash. You know? So it's decisions like that as a business owner that you decide, you know, how to run your business. You know, or like I said, you know, and, and you see it out at our stores, you know, hey, we have 25% off today. Hey, we're going to give cash back bonus where if you come after this date, you can use this cash, you know, like cash. So then you go in and you use it, but many times you spend more than that. And that's the whole idea is to get you back into the store. You know, there's a lot of marketing techniques that are out there. This is the math behind it, though. Okay. So you'll have a problem like that. I know I have one on your take-home quiz. I know I have one on your, um, your, your actual test. And I know you have them in the homework as well. Okay, but I think that's a pretty good, I think the most important thing that your book doesn't necessarily, I mean, if you read it closely, you would find this, but they don't have it written out that way. Okay, so that's an important um, little formula that will help you through that problem right there. All right, the next one. Find the dimensions of the largest rectangle, so I'm finding a maximum, okay, that can be inscribed in a semicircle. And then there's the equation for the semicircle. All right, so imagine this. This here is just some kind of semicircle. That is really bad, isn't it? Uh, I can't leave that. So here's a semicircle. I'll tell you the one on your homework is the whole circle. Okay, so it does change. It's the whole circle on the homework. All right, so this one here is a semicircle. That looks a little bit better right there. And I want to put a rectangle in here. All right, so the largest rectangle I possibly can. I don't know if it goes like this right here for the largest rectangle. I don't know if it goes like this for the largest rectangle, right? Could be either one. Just pick one to go with. It doesn't matter in your picture that it's the largest rectangle, okay? It's the math behind it that will tell you what point this has to be right here to be the largest rectangle. All right. So right here is zero. We don't know the distance from here to here. So I'm going to call that distance right there x. So isn't this side then 2x because it's x here and x here? So the length of my rectangle is 2x. In order to find the largest rectangle, I need an area formula for the rectangle. So I'm trying to find the length and the width of it, okay? 
So here is the length. Now, what about this side right here? This is this y value. So if I know the x value there is x, I could take and find the y value, which happens to be right here. If I plug an x in, I get a y value that's r squared minus x squared. So what that's telling me about my rectangle is that this side is 2x and this side is the square root of r squared minus x squared. So if I wanted to find the area, the area is the length times the width, I'm going to plug in 2x times the square root of r squared minus x squared. Now tell me about r in this picture. What is r? What is r in this formula? What's r stand for? Semicircle. Radius. It's the radius of the circle, right? Isn't it just a number? Isn't the radius usually just a number? Like if the radius happens to be, um, you know, say 5, then r squared is 25, right? So r and r squared are just numbers. So do you remember yesterday we said, after we get to this point, if we have more than one letter, then we need to take and write it only with one variable? Well, this only has one letter. That's the hard thing to, to get your mind to understand. The r is not a letter. The r is a number. So on one of the, either the take-home quiz or the test, whatever it is, I actually give you a number in there for r, like say 49 minus uh, x squared, you know, where I give you a number so that when you take the derivative of it, it just goes away, all right? Because that's our real concern is when we do take a derivative. So we're just going to leave it as r, but you've got to make sure you wrap your mind around the fact that r is just a number. So when we go to take the derivative, it's not 2r, it's just 0 because it's a number. All right, so before I go to take the derivative of this right here, I'm going to take and rewrite this without the square root, so it's easier for me to take the derivative. I am going to have to use a product rule here to take the derivative of this piece. So I start with the derivative of the first, which is 2, times the second, which is r squared minus x squared to the 1 half power. And then I have a plus sign. This time the first one stays the same, and I need the derivative of the second. The power comes down out front and knocks down by 1, and what's inside stays the same. But then I peel that outside layer away and multiply by the derivative of the inside. What is the derivative of r squared? 0. What is the derivative of negative x squared? negative 2x. I think that's the hardest part of this one. I mean, other than the square roots that are in here, getting your mind wrapped around the fact that r is just a number. Okay. All right, now we've got to clean this bad boy up right here. This here means two square roots of r squared minus x squared. This one here, this 2 and this 1 half, because half of 2 is just 1 there, they're going to cancel. I have an x times a negative 2x, which is negative 2x squared. And then this guy goes down to the denominator, r squared minus x squared. So just like yesterday, I read the problem, made sure I understood it. I drew a diagram. I put variables to the different things, which they kind of helped me with the equation that was given right there. Uh, I came up with a formula, and it only had one letter because the R wasn't really a letter, but I took the derivative, I'm setting it equal to zero, okay? So I'm on the final step right now of the, the process. Yesterday you had something that looked like this, and I told you, take the negative piece and move it to the other side. I'm standing by that today as well. You're going to see that on a lot of problems.
Then from here, multiply both sides by that r squared minus x squared square root there. What's going to happen is it cancels over here on this side, giving me a 2x squared. And over here, I get a 2 times. When you multiply two square roots together that are the same, the square root disappears. Like square root of 2 times square root of 2 is just 2, right? So the square root of r squared minus x squared times the square root of r squared minus x squared is just r squared minus x squared, like so. Either distribute the 2 or divide by the 2. Anybody care? They have a preference? What would you do? Distribute. Okay. 2r squared minus 2x squared equals 2x squared. Remember, I'm trying to find x. So next I'm going to add the 2x squared to both sides. I get 2r squared equals 4x squared. Working to get that x by itself, I'm going to divide by 4. Gives me r squared over 2 equals x squared. And then you take the square root of both sides. Now when you take the square root, that means you need plus or minus because of your idea to put it in. Take the square root of the top, r, square root of the bottom, square root of 2. Now, what was x? Do you remember what x was? In our picture, this point had the point x, square root of r squared minus x squared. There'd be a point over here as well that would be negative x, square root of r squared minus x squared. This is saying x is, this one is, r over the square root of 2, and this one is negative r over the square root of 2. So you can kind of see they're the top corners of that. But did they ask for the point there, or did they ask for the dimensions? Did they ask for what the actual largest area is? You know, you got to see what question was asked. So you go back up, and it says, find the dimensions. So what I need are these two things. I need 2x. I don't need x. I can need x to get 2x, but, you know, for my answers, I'm not going to give the actual x value. So my dimensions are 2x, which is 2 times this value, r over rad 2. And since this is the width of a rectangle, I'm not going to use the negative. You know, it's just 2x that I need. Uh, the side of a rectangle isn't a negative length. So I'm using the positive value. So this is 2r over rad 2, which if I multiply top and bottom by rad 2, I get 2 rad 2r over 2, which reduces, giving me 2x equals rad 2r. So that is the length or the width, whatever you want to call that sign, the length. Did they give me a measurement? Centimeters? Anything like that? He didn't. I can't label. And then the width is the square root of r squared minus x squared. So that's the square root of r squared minus well, my x value again was r over rad 2. Which this is r squared minus r squared over 2. Do you see that this is 1 minus 1 half r squared? Which is 1 half r squared. Under square root, of course. Oh, but that means it is r over rad 2. This is the width. The width turned out to be the same as what x was. On this problem, this time, you know. So that is your length and your width. Because there's an r in the problem, you're going to have an r in your answer. But when you do this, 
say, I don't know, homework. Well, the homework problem is um, going from the whole circle. So the length right here is whatever this value was for y, you have to double it. So it's two square roots of r squared minus x squared. But this way, from here to here, because it's, it's for a whole circle, um, it's still 2x from here to here. Okay, so there's a hint on the homework, what you'll have to do different. But then when you get to the take-home or the, I'm sure there's other homework questions, the um, test itself, I have a number in there. So because I have a number in there, you're not going to have an R in your answer. You know, like if it had 49, then R would be 7. So it would be 7 rad 2 and 7 over rad 2. You know, it has to have numbers in there instead. Okay. So that was a little strange. Right? A little bit different. Each one is different, guys. Each one. Here's the next one. Uses the distance formula again, which you used yesterday. A boat leaves a dock at noon and travels due west at a speed of 25 miles per hour. Okay? So, if this is the dock, and he leaves, and he travels in this direction, due west, at 25 miles per hour. Do you remember when we talked about velocity being positive and negative? Remember that? A while ago. If it's going to the right or it's going up, it's a positive velocity. If it's going to the left or down, it's a negative velocity. So what we want to do on this problem is basically say, this is the point zero, zero. This, bo this boat is going in this direction at 25 miles per hour. Isn't that going to be negative 25 since he's going to the west? All right. So he's going to the west 25 miles per hour. So what I'm going to say right here is, let's say when he's right here, which we don't know how much time that is. But if you think about it as an x, y coordinate plane, if this is 0, 0, wouldn't he now be 25 to the left or negative 25, 0? Okay. But you know how distance equals rate times time? This is his rate. I'm going to also multiply it by t because if it's 2 hours, he's at negative 50. If it's 3 hours, he's at negative 75. If it's 1 hour, he's at negative 25. So he's moving, and because he's moving, I have to keep in mind that his distance is changing. And so I have to make up for that change by putting the time in there. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, next, another boat has been heading due north at 30 miles per hour. So this other boat's somewhere down here, okay? I'll put B2 for that. Here's B1. Boat 2 has been heading due north. So he's like this. Oh, let's pretend he runs right into that. I was a little bit off there. At 30 miles per hour. Okay, so he's going north. So 30 miles per hour, positive or negative? Positive. Okay, he's going positive. So his rate is 30t. His distance is 30 times t, right? And reaches the same dock at 2 p.m. Oh, wait, we need to change something. We know how much time he's traveled. He's traveled for two hours. Okay, so let's rethink this point right here. This point right here from where he's at, he, how far south was he to start? Negative 60. He was at negative 60 and he was heading 30 miles per hour or, yeah, miles per hour due north. So his formula is a little bit different because we know his time. We know how much time he's traveled. At what time were the two boats closest together? This is talking about when their distance and the derivative of their distance equals zero. 
and switches from negative to positive. It's a minimum. It's a minimum distance is what it's talking about. Okay. So now from there, I have two points. Uh, that should be my y value, though. No, my x value. Let me make a little change right there. We put a zero in the front. There we go. Okay. So now it, that we have two points, and that's your goal. If you're trying to find distance, you need two points. Okay. So remember the distance formula. Distance equals the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. So distance equals. If I take this one as my second one since I have it as b2, uh, x2 minus x1, isn't that 0 minus negative 25? 0 minus negative 25t, which ends up really giving me 25t squared. And then when I take the y2 minus y1, 60, negative 60t plus 30, negative 60 plus 30t, got to get it in there, right? Minus the y on the other one, which is 0 gives me negative 60 plus 30t squared. And I have a little bit of algebra that I should do first. Combine my terms, then we'll take the derivative. You're home free at this point. That's the hardest part right there. Drawing the picture, getting the formula all straightened out. So 25t squared is 625t squared. Over here, this means negative 60 plus 30t times negative 60 plus 30t. Don't forget to FOIL that when you do it. That gives me plus 3,600 minus, let's see, 1,800 and 1,800 is minus 3,600t and then plus 900t squared. I do have squares that I can combine together there. 625t squared and 900t squared is 1,525t squared minus 3,600t plus 3,600. Now, I'd probably even go as far as to writing it with a one-half power just to make sure I don't mess anything up. Now take your direction. So kind of prep it for yourself. Get it ready to go. All right, so we have a power chain rule. The one half comes out front and it knocks down by one and everything inside stays the same. You could roll your eyes at this step right here. Because that's going to end up going away and not even getting in your way. It's just an ugly piece that you have to deal with. Then you peel that outside layer away and you go to the inside and you multiply by the derivative of the inside. Well, 2 times this right here is 3,050t. Negative 3,600. And then the derivative of 3,600 is 0. Now, we saw this yesterday. This guy with the negative power goes to the bottom, changes back to a square root. You might remember me even doing this yesterday. This and this, you can distribute it. Or you can bring it down and then have to cancel it later. All right. Well, half of 3,050 is 1,525t. Half of 3,600 is 1,800. So there's the derivative. And now set it equal to zero. We had one like this yesterday. We said if you ever have a fraction equal to zero, it's where the numerator equals zero. 
That's what I was saying. That denominator is just kind of in the way, but you can't leave it off because you might mess up on the derivative. 1, 5, 2, 5, oh, I my 5. 5t five equals 1,800, and divide... Divided by 1.18, or that reduces math frac to 72 over 61. But 1.18, well, 1.18 what? These were miles per hour, so this would be hours. Oh, goodness. That's not what the question asked. The question says, at what time were the two boats closest together? Okay. It starts at noon. And now we're in 18 minutes past, or not 18 minutes, 1.18 hours past noon. That's not a good enough answer. Okay. This is saying one hour past noon. So isn't that one o'clock, right? Now you got to change this to minutes. Take the 0.18 and multiply it by 60. 0.18 times 60 gives me 10.8. The 10 are the minutes. Now take the 10 off and take the 0.8 and multiply it by 60. It's been a while since you've done this. 48 minutes, or 48 seconds. PM. So this is the time at 1.10.48 PM. This tells how many hours, minutes, and seconds. OK? Since it started at noon. Now what if it started at 5? You'd have to add 5 plus 1. It'd be 6 there. You know, don't think it's just one because of that one. It started at noon, so I'm going to add one to that. Or if you want to talk military time, it'd be 13, 10, 48. Then you don't have to say p.m. Okay, because p.m. is anything after 12. It's uh, military time. All right, what do you think about that one? Not fun, huh? You can see why I added extra examples in. Because imagine if I only gave you two of the examples I've talked about so far. Like you might not know enough to do it. All right, this is the last one. I don't know if I'll have time to finish it or not. A boy is at a point A. He is right here on the shore of a circular lake with a radius of four miles. So if the radius is four miles, what is this entire side right here? Eight. Because 4 plus 4 here is 8 miles. And he wants to arrive at point C, which, look at that word, diametrically across the diameter, it's saying, opposite of A on the other side of the lake in the shortest possible time. He can walk at a rate of 3 miles per hour, so he can walk faster than what he can row a boat. And this is a lake. How should he proceed? Okay. So basically, this point that is right here at B, maybe is over here, maybe is over here. He's going to row part way, and then he's going to walk the rest of the way. Now, this is his row. I'm going to call this side R. This is his walk. I'm going to call this side W. You can call them whatever you want. But one thing that you need to remember from geometry in this picture is if you ever draw a triangle into a semicircle, then it is a right triangle when it goes with the diameter. Is if the diameter is one of the sides, it's a right triangle. So the fact that it's a right triangle, you might notice, yes. Oh, sorry. He's going to be walking here, okay? But I put that in 
to make a triangle, right? Because that's going to help me to find this angle right here. Good question. Yeah, he's walking along the outside of the lake over on that side. All right, so I put this theta in here to kind of give you a little hint that maybe Sokotoa, right triangle trig, could possibly be used. Okay. Now the other thing is distance equals rate times time comes up again on this. This said he wants to walk in the least, or he, he wants to get there in the least amount of time. So here I'm trying to find time. So I can revamp this formula to be distance divided by rate equals time. So I need his time rowing plus his time walking to come up with my formula, which means I need his distance and his rate for each of these. What I do know is I know his rate for rowing is 2, and his rate for walking is 3, so I can fill those in. But what I need is I need the distance that he needs to walk or row each of these. So the first thing is I need to find this side of the triangle right here so I know his rowing distance. All right. What I have is I have theta. I have the hypotenuse, and this is the adjacent side. So what uses theta, adjacent, and hypotenuse? Cosine. So I could say here, cosine of theta equals adjacent, which is the side he has to row, over the hypotenuse, which is 8. And what I really want to know is I want to know what r is, because r is this side right here. So multiply both sides by 8. And I get h cosine of theta equals r. So that is his distance rowing, h cosine of r. Okay. Now another piece from this one. I don't know if you guys remember, like, inscribed angles at all from geometry. Yeah. Oh, yes, it should be. I wrote the wrong thing right there. R is 8 cosine of theta. There we go. All right, next. I need to figure out this distance on the outside. This is an arc length. And again, from geometry, an arc length, if, you, if it's across from an angle that's inscribed on the other side of the circle, does anybody remember how that and that are related? Anybody remember? It is 2 theta. Good job. Yeah, it's double that. If it goes from the center over, it's the same. Like if theta was at the center of the circle going over like that, then that would be theta. But the fact that it's across from the circle over on the other side, it's 2 theta. It's double that. So that is his walking distance is 2 theta. This here is your formula for the time that it takes him. From here down is you're home free, you know? Like you could reduce the eight over two here to four cosine of theta plus two thirds theta. But then from here, you're gonna take the derivative of time because you're trying to minimize the time. Derivative of four cosine theta is negative four sine theta. Derivative of two thirds theta, what's that? It's two-thirds. Theta here is just like x, guys. Don't let it scare you in any way. And then from here, we set it equal to zero. I move the negative piece over. So that gives me two-thirds equals four sine theta. Multiply both sides by one-fourth to get rid of that four. And when you do, those reduce giving you one-sixth. And then how do I get theta by itself? Inverse sine, right. Now theta's by itself. And that's where you have to go to your calculator. Make sure you're in radians. Okay, always in radians in calculus. Um... Let me just check my mode real quick, make sure. Yep. 
sine inverse, 1 divided by 6. It comes out, theta is 0.167. From there, if I wanted to find how far he should row, I'm going to come up here and say 8 times cosine of 0.167. So 8 cosine, I'd probably say second answer instead, though. He needs to row 7.89 miles. And then he needs to walk 2 theta. 2 times that answer. Oh, I forgot to press times. Times that answer is 0.335 miles. So that's how he should proceed. If he wants to get there in the least amount of time, that is what he should do. So you can see, just about every one of these is different. Okay. Your homework, which you do have a work day tomorrow, it's on your calendar that I handed out. Was anybody not here the day I handed out calendars?